Greenlanders, we are only 56,000 people. We are probably one of the smallest populations in the world. And they look like me, and I look very traditional. And, uh, and we are living in the, the biggest island of the world. We have 2.2 million square kilometers of land, where of that 85% is covered on ice. Greenland ice part, only the ice part from north to south is 2,000 kilometer long. From west to east, it's 1,000 kilometer long. And it is three kilometers thick. It is the biggest ice mass in the Nordic hemisphere. The second largest uh, ice mass in the world besides Antarctica. And that place uh, is now the topic and most monitored ice sheet in the world. Greenland ice sheet is melting and it's caused it's because of the climate change. Everybody, like you see here, you see icebergs, iceberg, iceberg, the icebergs. Icebergs are just a normal part of our lives. A lot of people would be asking us, how come you decided to live in an Arctic place where it's so hard to survive? But we know where there's ice, there's plankton. Where there's ice, there's even more plankton. Where there's plankton, there's fish, seals, whales, and all the great animals in the world are there. They're better than the southerners' animals. <laughs> and that's why we chose to live there. But it has also required that uh, living survival percentage is very low. Child mortality was very, very high, one of the highest in the world. Uh, so it has always been very important to us. The fewer we are, the higher chance for us to survive. This way of thinking has always been there. We still have it. P each family gets approximately only 1.3 child per family. And uh, the population is going a little down. So we ask people to make more kids. Greenland is, um, is an autonomy. Uh, we, we belong to the Kingdom of Denmark. The, the Kingdom of Denmark consists of Faroe Islands, Greenland, and, and Denmark. We want to become independent. I'm probably one of the politicians in Greenland that scream loudest for independence. Uh, but that also is also uh, because uh, it's not just me. It's uh, the 75 percentage of population want independent, independence. I happen to be the first uh, female uh, leader of the country and also was the first uh, foreign minister of Greenland at a young age. And, uh, and I'm very, I feel very privileged that I have the chance to do so. The Greenlandic women are very strong in, in the democracy process. We are approximately half-half in the parliament uh, of Greenland. And that's not because we want more rights to women, it's just that women have always had a very strong role in the society we share halfway. We don't even talk about equality in the same sense as we see other countries. We want to do more for our men because they lack like a little behind compared to the women. Greenland is uh, self-sufficient in uh, clean energy. Greenland signed also and agreed upon the Kyoto Agreement in 1992 because we think that it's very important that we work for a cleaner environment, that we all take share. And, uh, and we took action. Greenland today, electricity is produced 75% 70, based on hydro plants. We will become 100% in a few years. Greenland will and want to produce more energy than we can use to attract investments for the production from outside and invest and build in Greenland and have the factories and materials produced based on clean energy and move them from other places where they make pollution. Greenland is ready for new thinking. Greenland is ready to we refuse to be victimized because of climate change. Even though we see icebergs calving all year round now, and it has never been as active as they are now, normally 
when I was until a big teenager, the, the glaciers would be active uh, until end of September. And then they would start again in May. Now they're calving all year round. And that means that uh, our weather also has changed. The predictability of the weather and environment is not the same anymore. Majority of our men in the smaller and remote areas are making a living of uh, hunting and fishing like my both brothers do. Their income is going down and um, in, in it's not certain anymore when the bird is coming, when the salmon is coming, when the polar bear is coming, when the reindeer is coming and so forth. That means that Greenland economy is very much challenged due to climate change already. That means that we have to do adaptations very fast, and we do so. And I think uh, adaptation is uh, the key word besides taking action on producing clean energy. Because of uh, the scientists predicting that ice, the North Pole will be ice-free in about 20 years from now during summer, that means the sea routes in the, in the future will be changing. The new transportation on sea will be going through the Arctic water, the polar sea, and uh, they will all be going through Greenland waters within our 200 sea mile economic zone. That means that uh, the policies that the Arctic countries are very important on how we want this new sea routes to be administrated and uh, be used. I was foreign minister back in 2008 when we took initiative together with Denmark to host the first Arctic conference on the North Pole. And that is called Eludiset Declaration. Eludiset Declaration is the 10th year anniversary this year. The declaration says that all five Arctic states, United States, Russia, Canada, Norway, Greenland and Denmark, together we signed to keep the Arctic pole water, uh, the, the, the polar sea, a low tension area. Low tension area, we want peace and, there was, and our polar sea should be used peacefully. And uh, all five nations should respect the law of sea. When the world map was signed, when the world map was created, they created a world map without the Arctic, really. Now they are re rewriting the new Ar the world map with the Arctic in the center of great importance today. Russia, uh, um, Chinese have last year, end of last year, just announced a new Arctic policy. China wants to be the new Arctic superpower. And uh, the Polar Sea is going to be very important for Chinese sea route for all the three, everything that says made in China has to find their way to Europe or many other places. And polar water is going to be very important for Chinese. Chinese are showing great interest in Greenland too. Greenland is very rich on minerals. We haven't just transformed it to economy yet. We took over our jurisdiction for minerals from Danish uh, government back in 2009. We have just finished uh, the, the law of mineral and law of big scale mining in Greenland for a couple of years ago. And that means also that Greenland has interest on opening new mines in, the, in our own country for better economic prosperity for the population and also to find another alternative for income that is disappearing from our hunters due to climate change. Greenland has the biggest deposit of uh, what's called rare earths mineral. If Greenland is to open a new mining on rare earths, we would break China's monopoly. And that means also China has a challenge on seeing that and their interest on uh, flirting with Greenland on this matter creates concern between Denmark and United States. And United States' interest uh, is different 
towards Chinese, whereas our interest towards Chinese is very different. Our talks with China is based on market, market, uh, market uh, circumstances, whereas Denmark-Chinese relationship bothers the Americans. So I see a possible crisis within the kingdom in very near time if Denmark is not taking action to politically sit with Greenland as equal partners on talking to each other on how to deal with Chinese within the kingdom. So it's a very challenging, uh, challenging way. And Greenland, we want to become independent. We can only become independent from Denmark if we are making us free of the substitute, uh, subsidies that Denmark gives to Greenland approximately 540,000 euros a year. A lot of people are saying that it's euros, yeah. A lot of people. It's, it's 3.6 billion Danish kroner. It's, it's, I mean, it's very small amount uh, for many. But for, for, for a small population like uh, the Greenlanders of 56,000 people, it's a lot. But I see the other way around. If Greenland is to implement and start new mines and find new investments in Greenland for sustainable economy, we can free ourselves from the subsidies Denmark gives. And that creates a new path for Greenlanders for economic independence. The urge for independence is very strong, but at the same time, the alternative how to free us from the subsidies is to big discussion. But nevertheless, Greenland finds uh, sustainable development very important. We don't do anything unless it's sustainable. This is our way of thinking. This is our way of philosophy of life. That's how we survived in the Arctic regions. So it's very important if we are to if we are to create several folded uh, economic growth in Greenland, it's important that we just not only fish, but we also have tourism potential in Greenland that's enormous. Also, the mineral uh, possibility in Greenland is enormous. And the possibility of even creating more energy for selling out is also enormous. So that means that we have to be able to think bigger than we are. Very often we think that the only economy that we have is the one that the subsidies that are coming from Denmark and the growth we're creating ourselves, that's the only world. We have to be able to think bigger as the Arctic nation as we are today that want to become independent. Greenland has so much potential that we could become one of the richest in the whole region. But that requires also that we change our way of thinking and change the way of, of negotiating with the other countries that we want to work with. When I was a big teenager, I have never heard of a Greenlandic uh, director, Greenlandic doctor, a lawyer, or a pilot, or even an educated teacher. Today I'm 52. When I fly over the Atlantic, my captain welcomes me on board, and he's a Greenlander. When I go to the doctor, I speak Greenlandic. I see Greenlandic people that are being educated as ever before as we do today. A lot of people that are writing about us in the newspaper very often are writing about, oh, the dropout rate is too high and the population is not educated enough. I always see the opposite side. From what I saw when I was a big teenager, what I see today, Greenlanders deserve an applause. What we have managed to achieve to heighten our educational level is fantastic. No other indigenous peoples around the world have achieved on gaining that much educatedness in, in, in the whole world. So we mean, we mean business when we say we want to change our way of life and we want to change the direction of our economic growth, but also our independency. This goes hand in hand. And uh, I think also that this is what the Greenlanders in general want. A lot of people are saying, Green, a lot of people are saying, why don't, we, why don't we get more tourists than we want today? That's because our airports are not long enough. So bigger 
planes can't arrive. And uh, our neighboring country, Iceland, they receive approximately two million tourists a year last year. And it's a growth ever. They, they can't take more than that. Whereas Greenland, we, we are so much better than Iceland. <laughs> Don't say it to Icelanders. <laughs> uh, we have so much to show. We have so much to learn. We have so much land. We have so fantastic areas of Greenland. Greenland has the potential, potential also to receive a lot, lot of tourists in Greenland. They're not come there because of beaches and hot summers and, 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 and such. They're coming there for the grandness of the country. They're coming there for our wilderness. We don't have animals in captivity. Everything is wild. Everyone has a right for hunt for, or, or, for their own sustainable uh, living and traditional living. Everybody has the chance. So we go hunting reindeer muskoxes every year with the family. Food collection is very important to us. Everybody has the right to do so. Who has it still in the world? And I must say that Greenland now is planning on three large uh, construction plans for huge airports so big planes can land direct in Greenland and not always have to go through Denmark anymore. This is one of the plans on how Greenland can gain greater economic uh, growth in the future. This is a, this is a picture of, a, of a, a very ordinary home. We like decorating ourselves a lot, not only inside, but also outside. Uh, we love to make things colorful and, and joyous because our winters are very long from where I come from. The sun sets in the beginning of October, and we don't see it again until February 4th. So we have months of no sun, but we have lots of twilight and northern lights, <coughs> and minus 20, 30. It, uh, it forces us to be nice. <laughs> it forces us to tell stories. It forces us to be good in our handicrafts. It gives us time for each other. A lot of children are born in September, like I am. <laughs> so Greenlanders, we are a very unique population. We have our own language that you can't compare with any other language around the world. That's why a lot of people find it very difficult to learn our language because it's our own language type. <coughs> we are the only population in the world that have never had any conflict with other peoples. We have never experienced war. Our language does not have swear words. We, we, we even trying to invent one, trying to be smart, but we can't. <laughs> we can't because the language is very positive. It sounds also a little bit about the population. We are thinking positive, also not to have bad influence to our environment. Well, our way of thinking, our way of uh, speaking, is very much reflecting our philosophy on how to treat environment. So thinking environmental correct and having our sustainable development goals goes hand in hand already in how we think. Actually, we, we joke a little and say that uh, <coughs> 17 SDGs, they took it from our way of life. That's very good. This picture is from South Greenland. We have three climatic zones. We have polar region, Arctic region, subarctic region. The country is so big from North Cap in Europe to Sahara Africa. It's that large. And uh, we have three time zones. And uh, most of us are living in this capital of, uh, of Greenland that's called Nuuk. We are 18,000 people there. The rest are scattered in 60 small settlements and 18 towns. Greenland is, uh, is very much modern. A lot of people are thinking that it must be quite primitive in many ways because it's so remote. We are not remote. You guys are remote. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our ice-free seasons is very busy. A lot of the world is, going to, is, is discovering us. Everybody's talking about the Greenland ice sheet. Everybody's talking about the glaciers melting. While it's being talked about, everybody wants to see it carved. So everybody's trying to want to come to Greenland and see the great icebergs falling off 
Now you can see it all year round. And uh, it does happen. And I do believe that the climate change is already happening. And everybody wants to see that. It's a little contradictory that they even have to fly to go and see it, you know, more CO2 emissions. But I think it's very important that people see it. People's mindset change when they are seeing the enormous ice falling off because we have to change our lifestyles. And uh, and I think uh, that Greenland is one of the only countries around the world where we still live very traditional as we do today. This is a, in, a picture taken in uh, Inuk, our swimming hall that actually has won a prize for one of the most architectural beautiful swim halls around the world. Our dog teams. This is the season for now. This is how it is every day. Uh, our hunters uh, have to move from A to B and that happens on the dog team. Uh, we don't allow hunting on motorized vehicles. We want to, we don't allow it because we don't want to pollute and we don't want to disturb the animal more than necessary. So this is the most silent way and most sustainable way, but also man-dog relationship is very important. Our dog is a full breed. It's, you are not allowed to bring your dog to the region north of uh, Polo Circle in Greenland because we don't want it mixed and we want to keep our dog as it is. Uh, it's Greenland, Malamud Greenland French dog. And um, my town, we are approximately 1,100 people, the whole community, and uh, 6,000 dogs. <laughs> it's like everybody has a, a car here, at home they have a dog team. But that also is being, that also is being endangered because the ice is getting thinner and thinner every year. And the thinner and thinner it gets, the higher chance that they could fall through the ice and drown, like my father did. So a lot of people, you know, are not having that many dogs anymore. Fewer and fewer dogs, and that means that uh, the climate change is also endangering our lifestyle and also endangering our cultural heritage. So we find it very important that this has to go hand in hand. In our thrive for adaptation to the new economy in Greenland, must not be with our culture as the payment. It's very important that we try to find a good way on how we can get into a new economy, still a strong culture as we always have been. In Greenland, education is free. Dormitories for students are free. Healthcare is free. And uh, pensions, everybody gets pensions from age 65. We don't see it as a luxurious thing. We see it as a natural thing to do for our people. And uh, for us to be able to have this economy still going the same way as we want it, when my generation go to, pen or to, to get our pensions, we will be the death of our younger generation because we are too many. The economy needs income. That means when I know that, when I will be needing one billion a year, uh, Danish kroner, a year in our budgets, because uh, if we don't find more now, we will kill our young people, they will travel all the places where it's easier to live. When I know that, it forces me to, that I have to cha change, change things today. We have to have the guts to change and adapt very fast, not only because of the climate change, but also because of, uh, of our population aging. So we are standing in a crossroad. I see the Arctic becoming a very important economic area where countries want to partner with. And I see also the area being getting into new uh, changes because of the new sea routes. We already built a <coughs> big harbor in, Gre in Greenland, in Nuuk, to give service to these big ships that are going to travel along the Greenland coast with a new sea route. For us to be able to give a service to these is also a new source of economy. And that requires that we have to work faster. We work faster than the Canadians, and we work faster than our neighboring countries. That requires also that we have invested in that. 
when we were going to invest on our hyd first hydro plant in the beginning of uh, 1990, we, st we needed one billion Danish kroner to start with it. And we don't have it. And we are not going to Denmark and ask for money. So we went on an international market, loan market, to, to borrow one billion Danish kroner. It was one big political discussion. But we did. And the international loan market gave us 10 years to pay back. Because it's good investment, you know, for, new re re for renewable resources. We paid back within five years. Mm. It's a good investment. Now we have five plants like that. And that means also that Greenland has become, has freed ourselves from our dependency of oil. And, uh, and Greenland is step three. So that means for investing big is next again, and that is on the airports to invest and, and uh, support our economy based on economy, eco-tourism. Do I have more time? Yeah. Oh, Do I have yeah. more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I must say that um, a, lot of a lot of countries are very uh, not, not, not too sure about how Greenland and Denmark relations are. Back in 1979, Greenland uh, created a new political situation that's called Home Rule Government. I was 13 years old of age. Back then, it was first time Greenland to get its own parliament and its own government. When I got confirmed, my mother had a speech to me. And when she was having her speech, saying that now I'm confirmed and age 13, you're going to the adulthoods very soon and everything, all the good things that she had to say, she said that, um, that I, she had not a big gift, and she didn't. She didn't give me a big gift. But then she said, still you got the biggest gift of them all. This year you have in Greenland home rule government. Greenland has got its own parliament and government. That's the biggest gift of all. <laughs> and that I should feel ownership to this government. I should feel ownership of this development that my country is going through that I should feel responsible uh, on making Greenland nice to everybody. What I didn't know was that I was to become the first female leader of the country. But back then I was thinking, oh my God, I feel ownership to a government. <laughs> but then when I later on thought of it, it's the biggest thing that a mother can say to each child. And I share that story to everybody, because I think it's a good story that has to be told to everybody to feel ownership, especially when we are so few. We are only 56,000 people. Our glacier is melting. Everybody is setting focus on our country. The new sea roads are about to open. The Arctic is going to be a place where a lot of people are, are going to travel within a few years from now. The Arctic is going to have a very central role and China is talking to Greenland, and other countries are talking to Greenland because of our, our location from being between United States and Russia, strategically. Because of many important things, Greenland is on focus. And when we are only 56,000 people with a very young democracy in the country, it requires a very strong leadership and mindset for young and elders today for us to face the challenges that we're going to see very soon. And I think also that uh, the parliament of Greenland and the government of Greenland are very much aware of the situation we have. And the situation is good. It's to our benefit. And I think uh, as long as it's to our own benefit, I think that this is going to change the, the whole economically, uh, socially, uh, culturally, and many levels of changes to indigenous peoples in the Arctic. We have a strong voice among the indigenous peoples. When the indigenous peoples' uh, rights were formed on the United Nations, Greenland was very active. It was the only focus area that we 
set our money to, to ensure that we are represented at all times when this was being uh, drafted. And we spent 24 years working on that. So we feel very strong ownership of the declaration that we think that this is the one that's going to bear us through big challenges that we're going to face with big countries that we are going to working with. Our own law on self-governance and indigenous people's uh, declaration on indigenous people's rights and ILO convention article 169 are the three very key important foundations that makes us strong when talking with big countries that we are going to be working with. Greenland has uh, two very important laws that we have adopted that's going to make us stronger, and that is law on minerals and law on large-scale mining. These two are very important to us when we talk with China that wants to have an active role within the mining in Greenland in the future. Chinese in the beginning were coming and saying that if, we are, if they are to bring Chinese labor to Greenland, they're asking whether they should have the same wages as they have in China or not. Greenland does not tolerate social dumping. Greenland will not tolerate any social dumping either. So any country that comes to Greenland are going to work within the legislation that Greenland has and nothing else. We have to be able to face ourselves in the mirror. We have to be able to, to, to have the economic prosperity with good conscience. And it doesn't matter if Greenland is to become one of the most expensive mining countries in the world, as long as we have a mindset and also a law that secures as much as possible sustainable development also within a new alternative uh, projects than ever before. So I think uh, this is going to be my, my, my closing on that. I would like to thank Mrs. Hammond. And before I take the floor, I have a question to her. How much does a hotel cost uh, for a night in, uh, yeah. in Iceland? Because I have been called Lisa, a good place for vacations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it depends where you want to go. As I say, we have uh, three climatic zones, polar region. There's only one hotel, so you don't have a choice. You have to pay that. Uh, the polar region where there's only 500 people living, the highest points in the north where people are, where people are living. That's called Surabaduk and Kanak region. And it would cost approximately 1,000 Danish kroner divided by seven for euros. Uh, uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's a bit expensive. It's, it's, it's okay. okay. <laughs> but but if you, when you see the standard compared to here, it's not okay. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, we have all, all levels of hotels in Greenland. We also have uh, international four-star, if not five-star hotel also. But uh, very often, you, you would see our hotels uh, are having the green key. So we are thinking environmental uh, with the use, how, 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 we do, how we deal with our our hotels in Greenland. Uh, any questions to Mrs. Hammond? Many hands. Uh, lady, uh, mm -hmm. can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hi, my name is Alexa Barbot. I'm from Germany. Thank you so much for this fascinating uh, perspective on something that is, I think, not, not, not enough. I have one question. Um, you mentioned the Chinese will bring workers to your country for potential projects. Do you think that if these projects are done primarily by Chinese workers, the uh, Greenlandic population will feel ownership uh, and identify with these new projects that are meant for them and for their sustainable future and their, their youth. Yeah. First of all, uh, the minerals of Greenland belong to the people of Greenland 100%. We negotiated that and got that in 2009. So it's, the, it's for us. And if it wasn't for us, we wouldn't open. But we can't open the mines alone because our economy is not strong enough. We need partners. So <clears throat> the partners uh, that are coming have to work and respect the legislation Greenland has. Whether they are from China or from Germany, it's the same. Uh, because we only are 56,000 people, that's included all old, and that's included 10,000 non-Greenlanders. Regardless what, when we start a mining, we will be needing labor from outside. 
and this people labor from outside is very important for us what standards they have to be working under. And it's very important for us that it is our projects and these people are there to work for a time period of t uh, for short period of time and they have to travel back again. These are very important to us and this are already set uh, by the Parliament of Greenland. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it's kind of a important Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Arshad and I'm coming from India. Kind of made me realize the importance of you know the climate change and the absurdity of having the most powerful man on the earth, uh, earth like the president of the United States, uh, tweets how he could use uh, quote unquote perhaps the good old global warming for you know to make his New Year's better, uh, make it more warmer. Uh, I, I just have a very um, uh, a silly question maybe uh, about the the new sea routes that are coming on the Arctic. Region, and uh, do you think that in any way it contributes to the climate change? Or if there is, then do you think there is any measures that are taken in order to prevent it? Yeah, yeah, the climate change. I think uh, the new sea routes is better for the climate, I would say, because the ships will be on the, on, on the route shorter than they did before. And also, they will be transporting the goods quicker uh, than they did before. And also, because of the north area, and it's, uh, it's agreed that it's a low tension area, the ship traffic will no longer go through areas where there is conflict. So it's, it's a win-win, I would say, with the new sea routes. Uh, when I was the Prime Minister of Greenland, I invited uh, General Secretary of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, to my region, to my hometown, that I showed you during winter. I wanted to show him what conditions we are living under and our own words on how we see climate change from people that are living with the ice. He saw that there, and he took his hat off for the people there, living there. And uh, if you look into his homepage, very often you will see he uses the pictures from his Greenland trip. And I think uh, it's very important that Obama and Ban Ki-moon both have been in the Arctic. It sets climate discussion on a little higher level. And it's very important that the world leaders also see this area and be there and see it themselves if they are to have the power to make the bigger changes quicker. Thank you very much. The last question, but I do my left. Um, uh, my name is Vaughn, and I'm from the USA, and I wanted to ask um, perhaps two questions, if that's okay. Yeah, we don't have time. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Okay, cool. So you mentioned about wanting to become independent from Denmark. I just wanted to know very briefly how and when that will happen. And also, secondly, because you did such a great job with that presentation, can you tell me a bit more about Iceland, um, Icelandic Greenlandic tourism and Greenlandic food? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I personally always say that independence will happen during my own lifetime. I make a lot of people angry because of that. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I believe uh, that it's possible during the time where I'm still alive. For being a person that is very political uh, active and political thinking person, and also very aware of the green process that Greenland has had with Denmark in between, uh, I can't imagine of a bigger day to experience when I stand with my people in Greenland, where our flag is being raised and uh, there's a new, new news in the world saying Greenland is today independent. I can't imagine a greater day. I want to be there. And I want to be there to fight for the day. And uh, secondly, of our food, we try, to, we try to eat as local as possible. It's not just something that we ask people to do, we do. Uh, we hunt approximately 250 polar bears a year for food. A lot of people are thinking that polar bears, it's, oh, you eat polar bear? Polar bear is an animal like other many animal, animals in Greenland. We have a quota, we set quota scientifically uh, uh, approved, approximately 250 polar bears a year. We eat the meat, we use the clothes for, for winter. And uh, we hunt muskoxes, reindeer, snow hares, uh, ptarmigans, salmon, 
whale, big whale, whales, small whales. We negotiate whale quota under IWC, International Whaling Commission, and uh, it's all based on scientifically um, based uh, uh, analysis. And uh, that's living sustainable, that's living off land, that's living off our traditions, and that's living with, uh, with harmony with nature. Any food that's being brought to Greenland in terms of chicken and pork and beef and everything are brought up with the ship for, for at least 4,000 kilometers up. Uh, so, and they're expensive, and they're not even good. So we eat uh, very ecological, we eat very wild, and uh, we eat very local. And uh, all animals in Greenland are free. No animals are on, in captivity. So we go out and kill the animal when we need it. Otherwise, they've had a good life all their life. Mm -hmm. So we eat our meat with good conscience. What does whale taste like? It's good. It's, it's really, a, lot, a lot of people are, are very, are very um, disturbed when they hear we eat whale and eat polar bear. But it's not. We are more disturbed in how you treat chicken and animals. Yeah. <laughs> I just uh, have a brief question because uh, I agree completely with what you say. I am a seminary on the director of media of the ICC. But I just want to ask you if you are agreeing with the following statement of yours. Don't you think that the focus of the campaign of the raising awareness, which I agree completely regarding the climate change, the problem that we have is that it's completely wrong. I mean, we are talking all the time about saving the planet. If we disappear because our fault, you know, and the planet and the climate is completely changed. It happened before, the planet will raise again. But the humans probably, we won't be here. So probably, I'm arguing that maybe in order to increase the raising awareness to the people and politicians is not save the planet, save the humanity. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, when the Arctic was being discussed, um, I, I remember approximately ten years ago, when first conferences started to, to take place about the Arctic and what's going to happen, why the ice is melting. Everybody wants to hear a little bit about the Arctic. A lot of people, a lot of scientists were discussing whether this would make an Arctic treaty to, to you know to stop any development and many other good ideas, how they think they can preserve the Arctic, the same way as there is an as Antarctic Treaty. I think it's the wrong approach. Antarctic Treaty, I think, is fine, uh, as they did it, but you can't have the same approach towards the Arctic just because it's cold and there's ice. There are cultures, there are people living there. There are uh, two million I I people up in the very high north of the world. They have their own parliaments and governments, the international society can't talk of it as if it's go they're going to make a museum out of it. And, and I think it's very important that when you talk of Arctic and create your Arctic policy like the European Union does or China does and, and Germany does and many other countries, they have formed their Arctic policies. And when you read that, very often you see that's their approach on how they, they should think of the Arctic. But this has been, this have been formed without any dialogue with the Arctic. And I think it's very important that a good Arctic policy is an Arctic policy that we as Arctic people also feel ownership to, to this, that we understand on how we should treat the Arctic in the future. So make, making plans of making an Arctic treaty is not well seen among those that are in the Arctic. Yes, please. Hi, my name is William, I'm from Canada. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, in your speech, you mentioned the sustainable energy projects and the need for airports, bigger airports that can uh, receive bigger planes. Besides these two initiatives, what other infrastructure developments are required, in your opinion, to attract more tourism and more investment? Thank you. I see, I see possible investment not only in infrastructure, but I also see sponsoring or in investing in water projects. Mm -hmm. The world will be needing water very soon. And we are, but, we are all but water. Ice is falling off anyway. It's the cleanest water in the world. And that has to come to bottles and be to the good to the people around globally. 
And uh, this water reservoir has to be transformed into jobs and water to the world. And I think uh, that is a very important and, and very good investment potential that Greenland has that other countries have to feel on a co-partners in, in this. Besides that, uh, ports are very important besides Aya ports. There are no roads connecting from one town to the other. There are no roads from one place to the other. So you have to either go by, by ship during the time where it's ice free and that ports are important or you fly. That's how we do it, we fly. And that's why airports and ports are important. Our, our visitors in terms of cruise ships is going this way. Lots, lots, and lots of cruise ships want to come to Greenland and see the icebergs carve themselves and see the huge icebergs, the blue icebergs, the green iceberg, the white iceberg, everything they want to see. And it's a fantastic country to see. But our ports need better facilities for us to, to see this, uh, you know, see the, give the service that that's required to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank very much Mrs. Hammond. I, I think I reflecting your feelings that we have been very pressed. We are, uh, we had very interesting things, things that we wanted to hear, and uh, the way they were presented made them even more interesting. Yeah. So thank you very, very much.